Here we go. Hi, Here Troy. We go. How are you doing, Jim? Pretty good. Been hanging out. Uh, no haircuts for, I don't know, a couple months. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I don't care. I'm not, uh, when nobody's uh, grinding too hard in the personal hygiene, I don't think. But haircuts. I brush my I mean, teeth. Yeah. That's important, though. That's important. It's kind of funny to see how everyone's evolving. I mean, some people yeah. just let the, let everything uh, go. Most of the my, most of the guys that work for me have big beards. They're, they're not That's looking. Funny. They're not. So looking. a lot of Miami, a lot of Miami shut down, right? Florida patches of it are open, but are you're shut. You're at the Biltmore. You're yeah, all the courses in Miami Dade County have been shut down for about almost six weeks, and just no golf at all. Yeah. Are we on yet? I think we're going to get back up soon. We're on yet. We oh, are on. We are? Okay, good. I'm ready. Yeah, no. Do we wait? We already started. Do we wait till we till can wait, We can wait a little. We could wait, but I feel like, hey, why not? Let's just go, you know? Uh, I'm ready. Yeah, absolutely. Good to see you, Clay. So, um, it's great to see you too, Jim. Thanks for... Um, spending the time i mean now you have the time i, I don't know if i would have gotten you otherwise but this is but this is like we've everyone's got, lucky day yeah you've got the time <laughs> so all right i i could i could probably spend 15 minutes going over your background and why why you've made such a huge influence on so many people and your experiences i'm not gonna do that because i think most people already know but i'm just gonna quickly say i mean you've done you've done so much as a player you've done so much as a learner and you still are, and you've done so much as a teacher, like the whole spectrum of rank beginner to tour major winner, you know, like you've seen it all and you've been around and it's not like you're 20 years old, like you've done a lot, right? Right. So, it, I mean, how many books do you have, 13? What was your last book? Yeah, something like that, a little more, but yeah, I've written a lot, of, I've done a lot of writing. Done a lot, yeah, right, that's right. If you're including the print magazine and you're including all the stuff, so, so I just, I wanted to kind of take a step back and, and, and do like somewhat of a retrospective, like big picture. Like you've seen it all. You kind of know what people are, definitely know what people are doing, but, but like, as far as I can tell, you're not afraid of anything. And you've done, you've done a lot with technology early on. And I, I just want you to kind of give me a little info as to what you're doing with technology now, how it influenced you from the beginning and um, where you think it stands in teaching now. Yeah. Okay. Well, the technology for me started with, with a sequence camera that we first used that uh, Ben Doyle used, Carl Welty used way back. Then we finally got video in the, about 1979. And then it came up by, you know, video for a long time. I had a swing motion trainer out of San Francisco that we used to do this, the uh, X Factor uh, articles on, uh, it, it was a pretty cool thing. It was worked, it was on a gyroscope and pretty neat company out of San Francisco. And then I had biomechanics in the 90s. Uh, then I hired Dr. Neil. You know Dr. Neil very well. I hired him in 2003 from Australia. And he worked for us for 11 years until we had all these changes. And uh, TaylorMade came in. They brought gears in. I had, gear, I had gears at uh, Doral and also in Texas, my school there. Then my body track came. Terry Hashimoto uh, came down, showed me body track. Uh, I had force plates before that in the, in the 90s. We had a machine that, that was probably not that great because you, um, you know, it was probably not that great. But it, it was a cool thing. We used to use that a little bit. I had a lot of tour players on it. As you know, we had the tour event for 25 of the 26 years I was at Doral. So we had access to a huge number of tour players. And in the old days, like when we did the, um, the swing motion trainer, a lot of guys, I mean, they all came down and did and Almost all of them came down and did it. Uh, it was kind of, they wanted to see the numbers and yeah, yeah. it was a little easier back then than it is now to get every, everybody to do something. But over a long period of time, we got to study and, and watch a lot of players and put some of them on uh, with Dr. Neil would come down. And we got quite a few guys on, on the 3d uh, with, with him. So all that, uh, all of that technology, has been great. And then, of course, TrackMan has been fantastic. We, I think it was one of the earliest pe per, people to have it. Frederick Tuxman came over to Doral. I had some nice talks with him about what was going on with the, with the golf ball early on. So, yeah, 
uh, te technology, uh, we've always tried, that's what we call it the super station way back is we wanted it to, to be high tech and uh, to get on, you know, on the, on the leading edge of the envelope. You mentioned X Factor. Actually, I, I want to ask you about that. So X Factor was what year when you, when you first came out with that? Well, the first ar article was 1991 with Golf Magazine. It's a cover piece. Okay. And that term has been bounced around, maybe yeah. misinterpreted, interpreted well, maybe not. I, I, would you get into that a little bit and, and tell yeah. me how you, the genesis of it and kind of what you were, what were you talking about at the time and yeah. What do, think, what do you think happened to it? Well, there were there are a couple of instructors I could mention that that berate the X Factor and they totally mistake what what's in the books. They obviously have not read the book, so that's a little disappointing because I see that out there, uh, Trillium. And um, it, it the thing about the X Factor and a lot of the things I've done has been by looking at patterns and I. You and I have talked about patterns and codes. What's the difference between a code and what's the difference between a pattern? Well, codes are done by man-made, you know, biomechanics, you know, measuring things uh, that way. And, and uh, patterns are in nature, flowers and trees and, and ob observation of what happens and observing. So amazing, you know, that's what I've done with you and all the people that have worked in the, in the system and my teaching system. And we've looked at patterns. What, what are people doing? Well, I did that for a long time before I did the golf schools. And that was with Carl Welty. He was the, the greatest researcher that I've ever seen on video and very, very detailed and very smart. So we did a lot of that work way back and, and uh, always been interested in what's, ha you know, what's the body doing? So, you know, from observation and, and looking very closely at what guys uh, and girls did in the swing, that's, uh, and, then, and then using the uh, swing motion trainer to uh, get the measurements of how much the shoulders turn versus how much the hips turn, and then the observations of how the transition happened, where the, on the back of the book, I, I wrote, it's on the back of the book, is the X-factor stretch is the lower body initiating er early as the shoulders are still winding up. And of course, I knew that from playing, but mostly from Ken Venturi, who I spent 30 years with, who was so big on the two-way movement in a golf swing, what he thought. He taught so many great players himself. But I learned- Wait a second, so two-way, you're talking about in, in the transition yeah. or upper to the lower? Something was going back while the lower is going early and the and lower went fast, early, quick, before, mm -hmm. before the completion of the golf swing going back. So that's something I've taught for a long time, as you know. But the thing that they get all really screwed up is the rotations, the X-factor coil. And uh, that was a measurement of, I looked at the, uh, a line on the knees, and then we, I put a line across the, my knees and my students, tour players, great players, and looked to see how, how much did they turn. It's not really a turn what your knees do, but your knees have obviously mobility and your Let's say for a right hand, your right knee coils in the backswing and goes back. The, the belt buckle moves back and away, a little to the right and back and away, and the right hip goes back, which is in the in the uh, in the in the book very clearly. Big picture, color picture, right hip back, and uh, that was the idea that the, the hips went about. There was kind of a, a a symmetry. I thought a real nice symmetry that that line was 25, and the hips were 50. And the shoulders were more than 90, 100. So the old thing was 45, 90, but I thought it was a little bit more. But then some of these morons out there say, you know, that it was no turn in the knees, like a frozen knees, no turn in the hips, or all, you know, all nothing. But, you know. How can you not, I mean, you have to turn the knees if you're going to turn the hips are connected. I don't know. You know, it's, it's, I think it's very interesting. I think biomechanics, of course, now measures things exactly what you're right. doing. But the problem with that, uh, the problem with that for you and everybody out there listening is, who, who are they measuring? Uh, what kind of shot are they trying to hit? Mm -hmm. Is and are all the tour players the same? So no, they're not all the same. Then you get an average. So are we teaching the average to everybody when really nobody's doing the average? Everybody's a little bit different. Right. Yeah. That's right. That's right. But by and large, and this is what, what I think. One of the biggest contributions I think that you've made, and I tell people this because 
it's just so it's so awesome to me. He's like, well, wait a sec. This is this is Jim McLean, everybody. Back in whenever I'm not going to say the year. He said, you know what? Way back. Um, you know what? We see a lot of grips. We see a lot of different stances. We see a lot of different postures. So you know what? Why are we call, why are we teaching the same one? What do they all do? What are the commonalities? And this was part of Eugene Car and also part of Carl Welty. He's like, what yeah. are the similarities? Like, what is everybody doing? And, and stuff that you can't argue with. You can have any type of swing. You can have any right. kind of personality. You could have a bad back, you scoliosis, blah, blah, blah. But guess what? Your, your backswing arcs would be wider than your downswing arc. You know, like yeah. there is lateral motion. There are stuff some like things. That. Right. There are things that you can teach and, and be sure, certain that you're okay in teaching. That's been, a, you know, with the eight step swing book, which you trained in. Uh, and you know that it leaves a lot of uh, room and genius for the teachers themselves to teach within those corridors. And there's a lot of room for, for all of you to teach the way you want to teach. And it's just a outline of how different the, the positions can be until you get down to halfway down to halfway through, which is what the track man does, which is the, you know, that happens in transition earlier, but when you get to the halfway down position, the delivery position, we call it step five, is is you're either online, you're inside or outside. The club face is either open square or closed. So you can see where that where it is right there. And then you watch how the club goes through impact and how it exits on the way on the way out. And the and track man or any you know good launch monitor shows you those numbers. I think Trillium, that one thing for sure is the students like to see the numbers. They like to see the, the things come up yeah. on the TV or the iPad. Right. One thing that you've done on, in your golf schools, which I've seen and seen, and actually I think I even had to make one before, is this giant clock on the ground. This is like the track man from, you know, before there's a track man, it's like, hey, the club should enter from here if you're trying to hit a draw. Or maybe from here with a fade, right? Like, that's pretty sim simple and what a good image for that. And now we can just, you know, you, if you've got an extra 30 grand laying around, you can just, you can really, you don't have right. to do, use any spray paint. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The clock is, you know, all the assistants learned to, it's hard to believe you were once an assistant, Trillium, really, and, and did no all the, the dirty work. And, and the clock was one of the things, you know, that we had to learn how to do. I think it's good to start from the beginning, start from scratch. So, um, John Wooden, you know, like, let's get our socks on right. Um, so tell me about, I want to talk about your leadership and leadership skills, because you've trained a lot of people, you've hired a lot of people, you've probably fired a lot of people. Um, but when you've got a, you've got a bunch of resumes on your desk, and, and you're trying to hire someone, what are some qualities you look for when you're, when you're looking for people? Uh, the most important quality for me is to hear from the references and, and who recommended the person, where they've been. Um, I like to see the playing, you know, that they have a, a very strong interest in playing and some competitive skills. Um, and then, um, you know, then obviously we get to meet them and, and talk to them. But uh, yeah, the resumes laying on the desk, we get quite a few of those. And I sure, I sure like to hear, get a phone call from somebody or, or, you know, now Grayson Zacher does a lot of the hiring. So he definitely brings everybody down to talk to them and, and watch them swing and, and, and listen to what they have to do. But because the resumes can look really good and people can kind of flower them up a little bit. But um, we, we've, been, we've had a lot of great people come down from, from your area of the, of the country, up in the D.C. area and especially Caves Valley and, and uh, Briggsy over at Burning Tree, but uh, New, the New York, New Jersey area we've recruited and then and the Midwest mostly. And I've sure. got a few guys have come from Portland and Seattle and California. That's, and then when, once everybody sort of gets to a, a place um, where they're a little, on, a little more stable on their own feet and they've, they've been down the road a little bit longer. What do you admire the most in terms of leadership? What, 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 or even other skills? What do you admire in terms of um, a good coach, good instructor? Um, well, I've had some opportunities as you have, you know, to, to spend time with some great other coaches outside of golf. For me, there's been great, there are great coaches in, in golf too. 
but outside of golf has been very important for me. Uh, when I was up in New York, I got to uh, meet Coach Coslett from the New York Jets. He, he brought me down to watch what they do, and, and I got to see his book of what the guys had to learn and uh, the playbook, basically, but also what they expected of the players. He got a lot of that from Paul Brown from the, uh, from the Cincinnati Bengals, and he coached with Bill Walsh. And I also got some good things from Bill Walsh from the San Francisco 49ers, and he wrote in there the, the things that he liked you know, nice. persistence, confidence, you know, effort, all of those things. I think a, a leader's got to show that they, they'll at least at one time done it themselves or put in the hard work and, and, and have good knowledge themselves. Uh, and they generally are good motivators. I went to see Coach Wooden a few times, and he was just great. He showed me how he ran his practices, and uh, I could call him on the phone. When you call Coach Wooden, you'd call – and there was an answering machine back in those days that everybody, a lot of people used. And then you'd just say who your name was. And then if he wanted to talk to people, he would pick up the phone. And uh, yeah, he, that was, so he got a lot of people that called him, but he loved golf and he was a good golfer. And uh, mm -hmm. uh, Tom Lehman went to see him before the Ryder Cup to get advice, which is, I thought, pretty cool. But all, a lot of coaches, of course, have gone to see Wooden. Down here in Miami, Pat Riley, is, mm. is has been phenomenal. I got to meet Pat and, t and teach him and to talk to him about. But he and then uh, I just read. I've read a lot of books. I, I met mm. Patino. I lot. I really liked his book. Was a great book to read. Um, Bill Walsh's book was great to read, also. So I think you got to read things. And if you get a chance to meet those people, it's, it's really good. I've met Bill. None of these people are in golf, by the way. And these are great coaches, no. great coaches, yeah. but they're not in golf. So I think that's an interesting point to branch out. Um, what do you think of Matt Wolf's swing? Very, yeah, very interesting. Well, we've seen that swing before. Um, I've watched Miller Barber in the old days who had, had that swing. And Miller worked with a, one of my really great mentors for me and great friends, Jackie Burke. And uh, Jackie was his teacher. So he, he just left it alone and he, he took the back the club back really shut and way outside and very vertical, uh, similar to Furick and uh, Ryan Moore. And then with a gigantic reroute loop to the inside there, but there's been great players doing it. And then Matthew Wolf went to Oklahoma state, like my son, John afterwards, but I've always been interested in coach Bratton. He's a great coach, by the way, talking about great coaches mm -hmm. and, and Mike McGraw too was, who's now at Baylor. I mean, it just, they were so great as coaches. I, I learned a lot from them and, and admire what they did for, for, my, for Johnny. But uh, Wolf just generates so much power. He, to me, you know, when I look at his swing, you know, he was a really good baseball player. I understand. I don't know Matthew Wolf, but, uh, you know, he's got that baseball start with right elbow high, up a little Freddie Couples like or, or uh, John Daly, uh, and just hammers the golf ball. So he's got great hand-eye coordination uh it's a it's a really cool swing to watch I'm, I'm anxious to watch him in person but it's only been on video and uh, you know some of the stuff that i've saw from oklahoma state there so it's really really fun to watch that golf swing i don't think you really teach that swing to people uh, mm -hmm. there's some elements of it you know like we always do what are the things that are common the the back swing is pretty uncommon I mean, but you can see when you get the club vertical like that, it's light and, and you get the elbow high. You got a lot of leverage to drop that right arm down and it's a powerful swing. So the guys that kill it, to hit it a long ways, get the arms up on the backswing. Nobody's playing like the old Scotsman with the tweed jacket and a corn cob pipe with their, with the uh, right elbow glued to the right side or the trail elbow. No. And uh, yeah, you can still but play that right. If you've got to give it to George Gankis for kind of letting the yeah. guy go with it. Absolutely. Right? Tremendous credit. I think that's fabulous to recognize the talent in a, in a, in a, a young junior and, and let him go. And I think that was really a fantastic thing that he did. So can we move into juniors? Because you've, you've coached a lot of juniors from, from a young age, like all the way up. And um, not everybody makes it. Some make it. Um, some people have great parents to work with. Some don't, you know. Do you have any do you have any advice for parents? Are there any parents watching the kids like <clears throat> me? You know, how do you get how do you <laughs> yeah. <your> kid? <laughs> well, some parents, you know, get too involved and they jump into the lesson and they're and they also 
teach the kids outside of your teaching. Um, and it can be a difficult thing to work on uh, with the parents. I mean, to work with the parents and uh, calm them down. I've had some crazy parents like you have, Trillium. It's, it's discouraging at times. And sometimes I've had to get pretty forceful with a couple of parents. And yeah, I'm not going to mention any names, of course, but there have been people that really overstepped their bounds. Um, mm -hmm. Overstepped, you know, they're, do, they're talking about things that they don't know anything about. Mm -hmm. um, I'm teaching a couple of really good kids right now. And the parents are, most of the, most of the kids that are really good have very involved parents, generally. Uh, and they're slightly pushy, probably, but that's the way you, you see it. You know, uh, if you look at most of the guys on the PGA Tour, most of their parents were, were very involved. They're a lot of times a professional themselves or a very good player. Or a good player. Now, Lucy Lee's an exception. I remember watching her. We, you know, we thought that lady near her was her mom pushing her. It turns out she wasn't at all. She was like dragging her aunt who was like had better yeah. things to do. But you know, begrudgingly went and sat there with her because she wanted to practice, right? Super disciplined, so, you know, she started when she was seven. She, and then she moved to Miami, as you know. She moved right there, right next to the, to the golf, to the range. Right. Everybody's got a different path, right? So how much are you engaging in a conversation? Like, the parents are going to be engaged with the kid no matter what. The parents are going to be there on the ride home, riding there to the, you know, they're always around at the dinner table. So, I mean, my personal feeling, and I'd like to know if you disagree with this, is, I'd rather engage a parent in it, in what we're doing. Like, here's the game plan. Here's what I'm saying. If you want to watch, right. go for it. You want to, you want to videotape it? Fine. I mean, I'd rather have them there so that they're echoing what I'm saying at least, and they hear the language and hear the tone and they hear the, you know, the, the praise versus the, the criticism. Um, um, it's just too much if the parents then saying, it, well, the issue really is his tempo. I've been to the tournaments and it's the tempo. So you got to work on tempo, you know. Yeah. That, I draw a line there. Yeah, I agree with that. Well, you said something really important, that you have a plan. And uh, you need the parents to be involved with the plan. This is what we're doing. Here's what I want to have happen. With Lucy Lee, since she was there every day, uh, I had my assistants know the plan and say, look, don't tell them anything other than, you know, one, two, three, that's it. And you can play with Lucy or, or you know, get in a little uh, – chipping or pitching game with her, which they did a lot. That was John Horner and uh, Adam Koloff and a couple others, you know, that were, that were my assistants that, that uh, Chris Green that worked with her on the other days a lot of times, but they didn't vary off the plan. And the aunt was pretty good because she didn't really, she didn't know anything about golf. They, they had the eight step swing book, you know, and they went by that and uh, just, you know, and she just hit balls and then she developed, she developed a really great looking golf swing. And I've seen recently, I just saw an Instagram where she made a gigantic change in her swing, which is a little, you know, that's, I, that's the modern way, I think. But she, she uh, uh, you know, really developed. Can, can you imagine qualifying for the U.S. Amateur when she was 10 and then the U.S. Open when she was 11? So that was pretty amazing. Talk about changes with me and, and people that have now in terms of a, the big deal players, people making, making money, paying big mortgages with their winnings or maybe paying them off. Um, I eat tour players, men or women. How many times have you seen someone make a really big change and have it work versus not work? Golf is a game of adjustments. You know, we're, we're always tinkering and moving, but big changes are dangerous for somebody that's already a really good player. A lot of times you'll see people who do definitely do want to make a change. Um, Keegan Bradley, when he came on to make a change in a swing, made a pretty big change, but, but he wasn't doing anything at the time. But sometimes you see a tour player make a change, then they're gone. They're out of here. Right. Um, you you got to be very careful with big changes, uh, changing the neurology of your body, the physiology, there's so many things involved with the, the entire body, all the bone structure and, and your muscle memory. And we know now that the muscles and, and different, and the bones actually communicate with themselves. There's, there's, it's the complexity of the body is unreal. So you, when you change something 
big, you've got, you've got a chance of, of, of getting worse. That's the one thing about golf. It's not like a diet where you try a diet and it doesn't work, but you, you don't gain weight. The, the thing about golf, when you make a change, you can get better, you can stay the same, or you can get worse. And uh, I think people kind of forget about the bottom line thing, you could get worse. I, I think that, I mean, I have to understand, and I know you do, why, why there are so many patterns or, let's say, fads that come out. And I'll call them fads, and I don't mean that in a disrespectful way, but we're all looking for some kind of formula give just give me a recipe and i think i think what happens maybe at a in a level where you're playing you're playing well you've played for a long time and this could be just a, a, a low handicap player it could be a it could be a you know professional and and maybe it's, you almost know too much you've been doing it too much too long and you start thinking too much or you kind of you're like i want why did I miss, you know, you're trying to shave two or three strokes. You're trying not, just not to have big whoops. You're trying to get yourself into contention, make the cut. And okay, maybe there's just one simple formula. We've seen this. We've seen it all the way yeah. at the tour level. And, and it's seductive and it's exciting, but it doesn't always work for everybody. And I think, I think the danger is, back to the skill acquisition sort of motor learning thing, is the danger is then, we have to suddenly think about think about a change that we're making, and then and that explicit thinking is a different type of thinking than the than the I've been doing it for twenty years, which is more procedural in the back of your brain. So this online cognitive explicit messaging you're telling yourself, oh, I need to get my elbow higher, elbow higher. Well, that's a word as opposed to just hit the hit the off button. Don't think about anything. Just let it go. Pull the trigger. Well, whatever whatever happens, you on your own, you've spent years to earn that. And so then to suddenly have to think and make that change means, okay, well, you better put a lot of mileage on that, A. You know, you better work your butt off. We know Tiger's worked his butt off. And you better be practicing constantly, that's what I mean. And then you, and then you better be able to make that happen, you know, when it counts. When you, and you don't wanna be thinking about it when it counts. That's just, there's a, it's a, just a huge price to pay. And I think people spend, um, they spend time doing that, that when they shouldn't, and there's some people that really should, but I think it's a dangerous thing if you've got, if you've got a pattern that works already, it's real dangerous to change it, I think, in a big way. Well, yeah, if it's working, not, not if there are shots you cannot hit and you need to, you need to be able to uh, change them, or, or you have a, a sh which the shot you miss, you know, where, yeah. where, where are you missing the ball? And then that, that you need to make some kind of adjustment to learn how to change that and stop it from being something that, that's a, a weakness in your game. Uh, a lot of times that's not a massive change like or going to a new way of playing. So to me, there's like two ends of teaching, like two extreme yeah. ends. It would be the complete dragger method of holding on and, body rotation and uh, all the all the big muscles and then then there would be the other one where you're, you're quiet and you're letting the hands and arms swing past the body a very passive body type of swing and then there's to me it's, it shouldn't be either extreme except you know occasionally with some people but there's a in, you need to be in the middle so I'm usually trying to get people to have a, a little more lag or a little less lag a little more from the inside a little less from the right. inside and they think about the method teaching, as, as you said, it's very seductive, and they have all the answers. And uh, I mentioned at the outset of this call with you about uh, some of the people I've, I've listened to that are, are, have been critical of things, and they, they have their way, and they get very good at explaining what they do, and they have all the answers. So they're like, uh, it's the Messiah complex. You know, they've got, they, they think they've got all the answers. And when they got all the answers, it's, it is very seductive to go to see somebody like that. I've learned a lot from method teachers, and they are going to help a certain sliver of the population. Yeah, go ahead. No, yeah, no, I'm, I'm agreeing with you. I'm like, that's exactly right. That I think that, that it's going to work for some person who's, you know, you, you, want, you need someone to oh, yeah. stay more on your left side. And you don't want them to sway. Well, if someone's a big swayer, that's going to be great for them. Well, belief in what you're doing, which I've seen in my life, when the guys would get on a, a certain way of playing, um, and there's some really good ones, by the way, um, 
that they really, once you get the belief, Venturi told me that, you know, from, that Hogan had said the most important thing in, in your golf swing is believing that you can do it once you're, once you're a good player. Mm -hmm. But the belief that you see and trust your swing, mm -hmm. uh, Jackie Burke had his four T's, I don't know if I can remember, timing, tempo, trust, and something else. But, uh, you know, those are the things that, you know, people Tenacity. don't. Tenacity. Can, can, it's an act. Can you, yeah, can you do that? Yeah, that's a good one. Can you do that in a tournament? Yeah. Can you let go? Um, and, and that's uh, having it, being able to hit it on the range is one thing. Yeah. Or playing with your buddies, but taking it out to a tournament is, it does, it, does the idea stand the test of time? You, which you and I talked about, what, if, mm. what are all the players doing? So what's interesting too in this conversation is I work with a lot of average players, like people yeah. who just who probably have pretty extraordinary jobs and lives and kind of roles in society, but are basically average players, right? right? 10, 15 handicap, 20 handicap. Um, path and face to me are just so important. And I spent a lot of time on that, just path and face. And it sounds real simple, but there's a lot of different body types out there. I'm not going to get I'm not going to get, you know, Hussein Bolt on my tee very often who can just do anything. I don't know why I thought of him. That's a sprinter. You know what I'm saying. A pretty I'm a good super, athlete. Yeah. Supreme athlete. But but that's okay, right? Like someone's not going to get their shoulders to 100 degrees, you know, in, in the top of the backswing. That's all right. They're going to have issues, you know, keeping their shoulder plane. All right, we can work around it. I feel like I'm the master of, of, of like hacks, like, in a, in like coming up with hacks for getting the job done. I'm not saying I work with, not at all. I'd say um, work arounds. That's a better way of putting it. Working around someone's limitations to just get the path and face where it need to be, you know, just get them on the course and get the ball up in the air. Let's go. Yeah. So that's what most of our teaching is. We, you know, on Instagram and YouTube, we get a lot of things that are for high, high tech for tour players, you know, which you and I have talked about on this, on this call right here little more but most of our teaching is not not that way 98 percent is with the average person to some degree and like the f folks you're working with you and you have to be creative you yeah. have to be interesting you got to be motivating and you got to get some way as you said to get the ball in the air and to have some really solid ideas maybe some great drills for the average player to do and and um, you know the things and and training aids that you can throw on once in a while I'm not gigantic on training aids, but I, I definitely throw them out from time to time. And there's a few things I use, the board, the, you know, that's uh, so important. I know Bob Ford just mainly, that's all, that, that's, that's Seminole up at Oakmont. He just used that, a two by four board, you know, and he thought this is all you need to be a good player. That was just that one thing because it, helped, it helped him so much. Yeah. Right. Speaking of that, some, one of my one of my followers asked Paul. He asked, "Do you have any great um, any great concepts for how to initiate the downswing, sort of starting from the transition, and maybe any drills you could re recommend?" Yeah, well, that's in. I just uh, wrote this new book called "Build Your Swing," and I, I uh, wrote in there that really the moment of truth is the transition move, and that's when you know, guys take an open club face and and make it square. They take a closed club face and make it square on the way down. Um, and transition is such a huge part of being a good player. Uh, so we have the loading procedures, getting back, of course, getting into a good backswing position, getting your body loaded up good in, in, in good shape. Even like if it's a 70 degree turn, Trillium, if it's not a yeah. big turn, right. but we've got to, we've got to get the average person that you and I have been talking about away from tension in the hands and arms and starting the arms mm -hmm. and the shoulders first, which is, such a horrible impulse for most people to do with the ball on the ground. You know, it's just so hard for them to understand the, the relaxation that it takes yeah. and using the ground. And I, I like to th say that the kinematic sequence, I add one thing. I put the feet first, the feet, mm. hips, shoulders, you know, so you can, and you got to practice some way of doing that. We do use other sports, uh, throwing a ball, chopping a tree down, some way of getting some little way of feeling that mm -hmm. lower body or the feet starting the the uh, the downswing and and not starting it down with tense arms and, and tense shoulders or of course throwing the club from the top which right. is you know he, you know we see that so often on our lesson t 
do you have so by the way mark chef dix head chef that little that pressure that little teeter-totter yeah, i love yeah. that thing yeah that thing works good i mean i've got a body track which is obviously you know my mm -hmm. what, whatever, whatever it costs a few thousand and then i've got my teeter-totter <laughs> With and it low, works very, good. Very low tech. And I, I use that thing all the time. I mean, it just pronounces. So it just pronounces where your pressure is at, right. at what point. Right. You know? Yeah. So I've used body track with, with Hashimoto for a long time and been yes. involved with them. And it's a, it's a great way to, to show people if you've got the, you got to have the right space, I feel like to do it. Uh, and you see that it's everybody's a little bit different, but you definitely can see where that, how the pressure moves in the, the trail foot and how, when it moves early onto the front foot, but wait, we've done it for years without using high tech is, is just feeling that you, as you go up to the top, as you start down and you push down on the ball of that front foot, as you start, mm. as you start down mm. and then you, it shifts back to the, to the left heel, to the trail heel. Mm. And, you know, you just practice that little move to get it going, but you gotta, you've got to add in the, the, uh, the softest. Now the orange whip, a lot of times that can be a, a really good training aid. For, for feeling that. I think the orange whip's great for more for the, it's for more for the throw release, and mm -hmm. which I think a lot of the most of the great drivers use. It's not, it's not mm -hmm. the, you know, the really the dragging thing, but it, you, can f you can really feel the loading of the shaft and, and the delay. And I do a lot of small stuff with the, um, the I also the like whip. with the orange, the feel of it. So someone who tends yeah. to get a little steep, it's just, it's just heavy enough to keep everything kind of in that right. Yeah, I do a lot of small swings with it so that people can feel the, the lags on the way back and lags on the way down and get it, and get it quick. And then they have to hit a spot. I put a, a line down and they have to hit, the orange ball has to hit in front of that line. And man, they, a lot of them, they can't do it with a little small swing. It takes them a while. And then they get that feeling of how the club you know, gets behind the hands on the downswing. I'm going to so use that. Huge. That's a good one. I haven't used it. I haven't asked anyone to hit the ground with it. I'm always... I'm always having them wash, but that's a, I'm going to use that, Jim. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. We got one thing done here today. We got, we got, we got one thing done. What else is on your mind with what's going on? Um, you know, we got Instagram. Everybody's a golf instructor now. Every, you know, it's flooded. Every, there's info everywhere. Um, what, what, what's your take on that? Good, bad, ugly, um, going in good places, cream rise at the top. What do you think? I, I think it's well for one thing it gives people the opportunity to actually see somebody and listen to them speak for like we are for an hour um maybe maybe pick up some ideas and there's a lot of different ideas out there the, the hard thing is trying to put this all together for yourself so do you when you go out in the tea that you're you got to teach something that you know the hard thing uh, you got to teach thing, something. You got to teach something. <laughs> so the interesting thing when you're when a really great player is playing and you ask them, you know, what they're doing, how's the swing feel? It feels like nothing. Mm -hmm. So it's really hard to go out and teach nothing, you know. Yeah, and right. that's that's the feel of a great swing. Like it's so easy. It's it's so the powerful, and it's so easy to do. Um, but that's when you watch a tour player on TV. Golf looks easy, or you go watch to a tour, but you it's, you know this looks like an easy right. game. And then when somebody tries it, it's right. impossible. It's so you know, hard like that's exactly right. And then in, after the tournament, they've been asked, okay, well, what were you thinking out there when you shot 61? Right. They say, well, nothing really. <laughs> and then you've got a million viewers thinking, all right, I don't want to think of anything because so-and-so didn't. And, and like that doesn't that's always work either. if you're no. 50 handicap. No, you got to have, I think you got to have swing keys. Almost every top player I've ever talked to thinks of something, including Jack Nicklaus, uh, Tiger Woods, I know has thoughts out there when he swings. The, the perfect idea about from the psychologist is no thought, no thinking, just target. But mm -hmm. I really haven't talked to anybody that does that. Bruce Litsky was pretty close. I mean, he, he was a different guy where he was very simple with his thinking. I think it's good to be simple, but generally you get some kind of takeaway, take it away smooth and, mm -hmm. you know, go to a complete finish. Those are kind of things I'll talk to a tour player about when I'm on the right. range with them. There's some kind of, a massive broad thinking idea instead of too but don't detailed. You think they've, don't you think they've earned it? I mean, especially if you're on the range of a tour event, you know, th that's not a real great time to kind of get into the weeds. But um, don't you think they've earned earned that right to not think? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it takes a lot of a lot of lonely hours out there and millions of hundreds of thousands of golf balls uh, before you yeah. can before you can not think. 
Someone just wrote, what are the downsides of an elite player not thinking? Uh, what's the downside of an elite player? Well, not I, I, I've got a good answer for that. The problem with that no thinking when you're playing is when you start playing bad, then what do you mm -hmm. do? Uh, you got, you know, you don't, or, or you know, you have nothing. That's the one thing I, so a lot of great teachers uh, I've talked to have really uh, been good at summarizing what the player should be doing. Manuel De La Torre, going back, this was our first national teacher of the year in the, in the PGA, said, I do this and do this, and you're going to hit it good. And I think when, when a, you go out to play and somebody said, Trillium, do this and this, and you're going to hit it good. Mm -hmm. And you go to the golf course, that's, man, that locks you in and you, and you get confidence, especially when it comes from a, a pretty well-known teacher mm -hmm. or, you know, some, or somebody you respect, let's say. Mm -hmm. And, and you know, that, I always remember that from, I've done a number of things with Manuel in the old days, and he, he was such a great teacher and, and mm -hmm. so firm in what he told people. Mm, that's interesting. Speaking of um, the old days, so Doug Sanders, I know, was a friend of yours, and he just passed recently, didn't he? Yes. I mean, yeah, what he about the, yeah. he, he was He was, what a character. What was he like? I mean, those outfits, I mean, everything. His swing. Well, Doug, like, swing. Doug he led a huge life you know he he had a wild very wild streak in him uh but he was a hard worker and he hit thousands hundreds of thousands of balls at growing up and he's had just super gifted and he idolized ben hogan and he tried to get the flight that hogan hit it he was a low ball hitter um he had four runner-ups and majors you know the famous one he missed the putt there to win the british open with and then lost the playoff to nicholas by shooting, Nicholas shot 70, 70, he shot 71 in the playoffs. So, I mean, he, I mean, the mm -hmm. guy was great. He won 20 PGA Tour events. But mostly he was a gambler. He did a lot of outside stuff, a lot of mm. big gambling games. Uh, when, I, when I was at Houston, he was down playing. We watched him play some huge money games, uh, cash games. And they did, they did games. Uh, one game they did was where you had to drink a beer every hole for 18 holes. And uh, playing for a lot of money, I, that was a pretty interesting game. I, I actually saw some of that. I didn't watch the whole thing, but <laughs> yeah, to shield your eyes. Yeah, yeah. Rob here asked, "What yep. do you agree that that Sevy, um, Rob? One of, one of the questions down here said, do you agree that Sevy lost it when he started to take lessons?'" Um, well, Sevy, yeah, I th yeah, I agree with that. You know, I saw it happen at Doral. Uh, where he was really working hard on some super detailed stuff. To me, he was the, the all-time artist. You know, he had his own mm -hmm. swing. It was a little bit of a wild swing to, to a degree, but the guys that played with him just marveled at what he could do with a golf ball, the kind of shots he could hit, the height that he could hit a golf ball, the length that he had. He was super long. Mm -hmm. um, he, he won, I mean, he won tournaments when he started right out when he was 18, 19, he just burst on the seal, won the Masters twice. What, what did he win? Five majors? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I think. Five majors. Five, five majors, ranked number one in the world for a long time. Yeah. Uh, you know, and then he made a big change, and it didn't work. Period. Did not work. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Grant asks, when teaching higher handicap players, do you tend to teach path and face or focus on good contact first? Yeah, with higher handicappers, I try to back them off pretty good. Uh, you know, I do do smaller swings to start with, get them to get into some good impact alignments to a degree, understand that they're hitting down on the golf ball and, and that the their path, yes, it's not coming out over the top. And you, that takes a bit of time to work on those things. But you said it right from the beginning. So many people are hitting it with an open face and slicing the ball. A lot of times I'll start – the, the club face really shut. Uh, Mr. Harmon did that. I just talked to one of his assistants. It's uh, a really cool guy, Lex Alexander. He's writing a book. And, uh, you know, Mr. Harmon would set the club in really shut. I've done this a lot of times at address with a high handicap player and then make him hit it to the right. And uh, that just, you know, that just does it, you know. It's a, such a genius thing. Uh, yeah. Good one. Yeah. Right off. That's a good one. Um, what's the key, one key thing to being consistent in golf? Is another question. Of one, me, I, I wish there were one key thing to being consistent in golf. You got to hit the center of the club face. That's fundamental yeah. number one. You know, if you yeah. can't do that, if you're hitting it all over the club face, there's no way to be consistent. I Period. like that, Jim. I mean, I 
my brain just went like it kind of exploded thinking jesus there's so many different components but you're right if you don't have that i mean you're right it comes down it you hit on the toe and the heel and the hosel and Jeez, the questions are coming by there quick. I'm missing They're them. Flying in. Okay. Oh, here's a good one. Who's this? This is Dan. Jim, what do you know today you wished you knew, you know, 10, 20 years ago? What do I know today? That's a that's a really good question. You're like, I can't remember. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, I'm so old, I can't remember. I've got a good memory. It's just really short. Can't answer the question. <laughs> Let's do another one. All right, so let's say if you are new new to a club, assistant pro, what's the best way to quickly build a lesson base? That's a really good question. Yeah. Uh, first of all, do free things if you can, you know, where you can go up and do some free lessons on the range and, and get to know people and, and let them know what, you've, what your background's been, what you've, what you've studied, what do you know, that you're interested in working with people. Um, you know, you got to start out slow uh, by doing things, you know, you got to have an affordable price, probably or a price point at the beginning, you got to get people to come see you. Mm -hmm. Well, we're, we're able to use social media a lot now. And, and that's a great way to get a lot of people interested in what you're what you're doing. Um, you, you can send things out to the membership if, if the pro will let you, I, I, you know, all head pros are different. I don't know what you're you're, where you're starting out as, but most of the professionals are going to want you to teach a lot. So you probably have the support of the pro, maybe doing things with the head pro, if you could do a couple of clinics with them. Uh, I started out doing clinics at Westchester Country Club uh, with uh, one was Mary Lena Falk, who's, who's was a phenomenal person, a great, great player and a great teacher, a Harvey Pennock. And we did, we did the ladies clinics. So I got to quite a few lessons from, from doing the clinics. They weren't expensive. And I used to do some free clinics when I was the pro too. And, uh, you know, those are things you got to get people interested in what you're doing and you got to, you know, build that lesson book up, but we all like to do things right away. And it just generally doesn't happen that way. Yeah, that's right. I remember too, also at Durrell, you were doing free clinics down at Durrell. I mean, every single Monday we had a free clinic down there. He was an assistant or a teacher and, you know, sometimes you'd swing on by, you just never knew what you're going to get. And, yeah. um, and I thought that was a great way to draw people in, get the conversation going, get people thinking about golf and show them what we were doing. Yeah. And also for you to go out and, and to do a, an hour clinic and, and have to speak in front of people and have a coherent message. Um, and that really is a big thing for a teacher to be able to speak well, to be able to talk, uh, the, talk the talk. What are you teaching? Right? What, what, are, what are your ideas in teaching? Can you articulate that? Articulate that? Can you talk to somebody and say, "Here's the things that I'm teaching"? Yeah, that's right. I love being on a team. I love being on a team still, and I think that was one thing you, that you did really well with your schools. You got everybody coordinated, so not everybody was, you know, in lockstep singing the exact same song, but everybody was, you know, the alto, you had the soprano, the bass. Like people would just everyone coordinated well, so that if if there were five of us working with the group. I wasn't going to say something and another guy was going to say another thing and then you have confusion. So I think if you, if you are an instructor or you're, you're an assistant and you're looking to build a, you know, a program at your club, it's important that you have teaching meetings so that everybody's communicating and understanding things. Yeah. Well, we had a little different situation down at Durrell with a lot of teachers and assistants, which was really cool. And obviously to run, well, maybe it's not obvious, but to run a good golf school, a great golf school, you got to have people on the same page. You know, you've got to be, you can't have people teaching opposite ideas. Uh, we have a pretty broad based ideas, but also we go right to those uh, fundamentals and also to the anti fundamentals. We call them the things you can't do death moves, but, um, yeah, for, for us at a school, we, we had to be really on the same page. Uh, I think that worked great for me down here. At, at a private club, you could have two people teaching opposite ideas, and some people will go to that person, some people will go to this, this, this person. I think that, that's okay, but I think you just have to be very good at knowing what, what you are teaching. And a lot of people are teaching one thing one month, and then the next thing the next month, and they don't really have a basis for what, what they are teaching. It changes from year to year. Yeah, that's right. Dave says, what percentage of practice time should be devoted to short game? Well, I'm being, I, I, I think a lot of, a lot of 
percentage to short game it it, it depends on the person I, i've used the this idea of a 25% rule where, where there's the long game, the short game, the mental game, and the management game. And then I try to look at each student where they need to be working. But with a junior golfer, I try to have them work, it, you know, 75% on the short game and 25% on the long game. They can do a lot of that short game stuff out on the golf course. But the kids have the time and the, and the willpower probably to go and do a lot of short game work where an adult, has limited time it's really not that much fun to go putt for an hour or to go chip for two hours or hit right. an hour of bunker shots right. we force people to do that at a golf school which is cool yeah. but I, I ask people when's the last time you practiced in a bunker it's like you know never no. yeah i actually one of the questions here was i don't know sam or someone's like i can't get out of a bunker help but it, i don't yeah. know how we're gonna help you sam right now <laughs> well we could talk a little bit about it. You know, you know, your setup where you're not leaning the shaft forward. I, I've teach the same thing I learned from uh, Mr. Harmon at Wingfoot and then out in California when I spent a lot of time with him. And he was just so brilliant with the with the bunker game. And Tiger used those ideas when he worked with Butch. But you got to use the bounce of the club. So you got to use figure out some way to having the the club come in so you're effectively using the bounce. You got to have a good sand wedge. Most people do have a good sandwich. I see now most all the companies make good sandwiches. I think some are a little bit better than others, but, but using the bounce so that you're entering the sand at the right spot, it's easy to put, put a line in a bunker and see how good you are at hitting that line. And you should start definitely on the lead side, your forward side and go more forward. You know, that, Mr. Harmon would start you a little open, a little more weight left, and then definitely using the rotation of your body to, to get power, not just weight lifting. Left, above. Including, including kind of head left of the ball, upper center left of the ball. Excuse me? Sorry. In, in the setup. So, so everything left, not just the pressure. Oh, yeah. So I'm, I'm watching you go the other way. I was worried going backwards. Yeah, no. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, getting, getting a little more forward uh, on, the, on the swing, digging in a little bit, feeling more weight on the forward lead side, getting your, your, your sternum more vertical. We definitely don't want to get under underneath it and get get the club entering far be, behind we got to get a, a good angle on it and um you know you, you gotta have the right amount, the right amount of steepness and the right amount of shallow it can't be too much of either one that's right and now i learned from you distance control in the bunker i thought that was just awesome in terms of follow through yeah. do you want to do you want to elaborate on that do you have any other uh, ideas about distance control within the in a bunker yeah, at Doral, we had these cool stairs that you walked into the bunker. You know, it was just a pit they put there, right. but I loved it because you had to walk in the stairs. So when I'd work with people, a lot of times I'd have them hit to the first stair, the second stair, we'd work up out of the bunker. And uh, the the way I control distance in teaching is short finish, short short shot, long finish, long shot. shot and uh when you did that short shot you definitely leave that club face open coming through really open and just to hit that little short bunker shot which a good player needs to be able to do but with a full shot what i love with mr Harmon was where there was no leaving the club up the sky he wanted to release so i always felt like i learned that teaching the ladies clinics uh where we had a ton of ladies at, at westchester country club when we went in the bunker and I taught them my way, and it just didn't work. So when I when I went over to Wingfoot and learned what, how he had the release to get the release of the club, then I could get the power. So it's definitely not that hold on, hang on type of bunker shot. It's a full release bunker shot, like you see um, Tiger Woods hit on a full bunker shot. Right, interesting. And what about speed? Fast, slow? Do you mess Fast. with that at all, with people? Speed, yeah. Yeah. Speed your friends. Slowing down is really bad uh quit quitting is bad no good you've got to have uh, acceleration in there yeah we need some graphics like a thumbs down graphic yeah. that's <laughs>
That would be good. We, you know, if I knew how to use everything there, I see everybody putting a little emojis up there, and uh, you know, yeah. yeah. Do you think that? Do you think? Uh, oh, let's see. This looks like Joe Miller, or I guess the name right. Um, golf ball, distance of the golf ball, ruining the game. What do you think? Bifurcating. I don't like what's happening with the. I think it's going too far. The courses mm -hmm. are getting too long. You, if you just look at everything that's happening outside of golf we're kind of going the opposite way we're making the the layouts longer uh the rounds longer the watering more the uh, the environment suffering a little bit more so it, it just seems to me that it, the disparity between what a pga tour player is doing and an average an average good golfer is just a joke it's, it's not even remotely close we're back a long time you know 30 years ago it actually wasn't that much different between a good player at the club and a pro as far as distance. Yeah, they hit it 50 yards further, but they didn't hit it 150 yards further like they are like Brooks Kepka or, or Rory McIlroy. Um, Gary Woodland I worked with a lot. It's just, it's a joke how far they're hitting it. Or that goes really for any good athletic young person, reasonably young person can hit it over 300 yards sometimes. So I think it, it's, um, hasn't been a great thing for golf actually that's interesting I, yeah yeah we are Sorry. we're gonna i don't want to get cut off so i want to i want to say goodbye in our own terms because you know this this thing has an hour limit um jim thank you so much i've got one this is a sort of a fun personal question but if you could have any other profession or if you could you know if you could do anything else what would you do not saying that you don't love what you do now but you know yeah. No, I would, love to, I would love to play baseball. I love baseball a lot. Uh, so I still go to the games down here in Miami. Um, I don't know if we're going to play this year. I would love to play a sport. I love basketball, too. I was a basketball fanatic, but um, playing. Um, those would have been great. Probably something in sports I, I would have liked to have done. Uh, I do, and I also i have loved writing. Uh, I, I liked, I've always written a little bit. I write, usually write a little bit every day and something and uh it's an it's evolved into writing some books it's a pleasure talking to you jim you're a big big influence on me you've been a my earliest mentor probably the strongest and i really appreciate all that you've done for the game and all you've done to um to kind of help everybody amateurs and pros and other coaches so thank you so well, much th thanks for having me on Trillium, and look at what you've done in golf since i first saw you down here in miami and you know, and you're a superstar now. So congratulations on everything you've done. And I really appreciate you having me on. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks, See you. everybody. Bye. Bye.